Okay, uh, welcome uh, everyone and a uh, very good morning. Uh, <clears throat> I am I'm glad that uh, most of you when you encounter this uh, this timeless uh, chapter that more questions uh, came like uh, when Fazil like shared it I was like eh. you know it's like it was written today, and then still you're, <coughs> like, you're collapsing the seventies and the future in which it's going to be uh, published. And uh, Mike, thank you so much uh, for for uh, for teaching us through this risky path, <laughs> because you're going to push us to to think critically, right, and uh, to generate more debate. Because like this is what, what I like about the the spirit. Of this chapter as it is that uh, it opens up a uh, more debate to the topic that is considered very much uh, closed. Uh, just to note that uh, there will be no discussion uh, today as Matalito, uh, the his friend had a, a crisis of losing a beloved one, so he's going to he's, he's, he's going to Limpopo for the funeral. Arrangement. So Mike is going to present for 30 minutes, and then yeah, after that we are going to have a, a very very fruitful uh, Q and A. So without further ado, Mike, uh, the floor is yours for 30 minutes. Thank you very much. I know I know, I know that you prepared for 10, but <laughs> just take us through 30. Thanks to each one of you for coming. I really appreciate it. Um, well, it's exciting to talk about this. <coughs> well, it will become evident why it is exciting, you know, just to be able to do that. And could well have been that it would never happen. I'm not my talking, but what we're going to be talking about. Um, so, um, as you, you know, you, you've been given this document. Um, whether you've read it or not read it, I don't know, it doesn't matter. But it's, it's, it was written by Karl Mittermeier, 1977. Um, and so obviously I owe you an explanation. Why should anybody talk about this that was written 45 years ago in this world that is so fast moving, um, where knowledge changes us all the time? Um, and while it's a privilege for me to talk on Carl's behalf, um, not that I want to claim I can talk like Carl because, you know, he was something else, um, but um, I'm privileged to be able to talk on Carl's behalf and, and I'm very happy because his thought has always been the sort of, not just approach to economics, but his thought has always been that, ah, oh, that is really interesting. This is why I came to university, you know, all these other subjects or whatever we did, whether it's in economics or other subjects, they just seem to be very superficial and veneer on things, but, but that wasn't ever the case um, for Carl. Um, and it, it's taken, okay, we'll, we'll, our discussion will be around this notion of exposed and ex anti facts and, and why it is important not just to economics, but other subjects. Um, now, w okay, before, before I get into that, let me just give you a bit of, a, a bit of um, what my plan and intention is of this talk, otherwise I'm going to be all over the place. Um, there's just so much to be said. Um, first, I want to talk about the genesis of the book and of the, con the genesis of the conceptual framework. Um, which makes me having to talk about Carl a bit more, some of the other publications. I want to give you a bit of a background to economics and how it fits in. I don't know how much economics um, you've had individually. Um, and of course, there's so many different ideas of what economics is, so I've got to give a bit of a background. Then we'll talk about the conceptual framework, and he's using that expression, um, exposed and ex anti facts. And then um, wanting, taking that conceptual framework, applying it to economics specifically, and it 
really is a critique of economics, but Karl wasn't the sort of person who criticizes things. He wanted to say, okay, well, we really got to create something new. We've got to um, develop something that is actually useful. Um, and this, this is what he lamented in economics. It's like, well, you know, what, what, what is useful in economics? Um, those of you who know some of economics know that we're working with lots of assumptions, perfect competition, and all sorts of unrealistic things. Um, and only the economists believe it's useful, and, well, politicians sometimes as well, if it suits them to justify what they're doing. Um, and it, it's got to do, and, and that application has to deal with preference theory in economics, which is at the core of economic thinking, well, the core of economic theory. Um, and, and when we, and then I, I want to talk about the relevance of it, that's of course, you know, um, I'm not sure how much of this I'm going to get to do. Um, but now, the title itself is a problem, isn't it? The empirical content of economics. It's a real problem. Um, because we think of economics to be empirical. We call economics an empirical science. Um, if it is scientific, we call it, you know, economists like to call themselves, or their subject, the queen of the social sciences for the very fact that it is empirical. And Carl really says, what is the empirical content of economics? Because, and that, that takes me in, um, that, and by the way, this, you know, before I move that slide, here we've got this other, this in green, it says a realist philosophy of economics, because the publisher for this book um, prefers another title rather than the empirical content of economics. And, and so the proposed title is a realist philosophy of economics. Um, you know, that's that can be part of a debate that we have here elsewhere. Um, because what, you know, if, if you look at Karl, um, he lived from 1938 to 2016. He was an economist at Old Mutual in 1962 to 66. So 1962, that's the year when I was born. <laughs> and then he was at econom in the economics department from 1967 to 2002. I mentioned he was an economist at All Mutual because it's important to the story. Um, he wrote economic reports, and they, you know, in the 1960s, they didn't look much different from the economic reports that, that you read today from banks or the World Bank and other institutions. Lots of statistics, lots of data. And he, he you know, when he, when he was working there, he said, why exactly did I study economic theory? Because the economic theory that, that we were studying um, Neoclassical economics, um, general equilo equilibrium theory, supply and demand theory, um, really has very little to do with the reports that he was writing. And that if you wanted to write a, 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 a coherent report that had any meaning, it, you know, you'd be better off having studied, studied statistics than, than economics. So, so that's, that's really what brings the title, the empirical content of economics, because let's remember, and I've heard this, an expression again yesterday and uh, at a seminar uh, and in other seminars here, um, certainly yesterday, the notion of a priori was very important because we are, as economists, we prejudging, our theory is prejudging what we see out there in the economy. It's like, you know, the Kantian a priori. Um, but then, if, if it's all already prejudged, if you like, you know, if, if, if your theory is really a priori, then what is the empirical content? And, and so, of course, it's, it's got, it, it addresses huge philosophical issues that, that have to be dealt with. Um, about Karl, okay, so about this particular book. So he was at Old Mutual, 
And you realize this is a real fundamental problem in, in economics as he saw it. He happens to go to a talk presented by Professor Ludwig Lachmann. I'm not sure if any of you know Ludwig Lachmann. He's like one, one of the leading economists ever in South Africa. He was head of WITS um, from 1947 at, in economics. He was like one of the leaders of what is called today Austrian economics. Oh, and by the way, if you have any questions along the way, raise your hand, okay? It's certainly when we get into some of the economics, if, if it's questions for, for, for clarification, I'll be happy to answer them. Um, so, Lachmann um, had a different take on economics compared to the neoclassical economics that he had been exposed to, mathematical economics, econometrics. And so um, that motivated Karl to apply to get a post at Witts University. And I think um, he impressed Lachmann sufficiently to, to invite him to come to Witts. And of course, Lachmann, critical, if you like, of, of economics, but from the perspective um, of, of the liberal economists, that it's, you know, it's, it's all about free markets and, and, and it's all about the subjective element in valuation, and, but also the subjective element in the sense that, you know, we don't really know what's going to happen in the future, so it's all about expectations. Um, and, and, and it's not that Carl identified with that approach either, but, but you saw an opening to, to discuss that. So, um, he, this book that we've got here, that the first chapter of, no, this one isn't here. So he's been thinking about these issues from about 1960, well, from before 1967 to 1977. Then in, in that year, he takes a year sabbatical and he writes this, 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 this work. At the time, and he had, at the time he was registered as a master's student at Wits University. Um, he registered as a master's student in 19, I think 1972, 1973. Ac academia was different then compared to what it is today. And he's a sort of academic who, who engaged in a subject for the sake of the subject rather than for the sake of a career. Um, and, and then he, in 19, so having written this and his wife actually sat on a typewriter and typed it all out. Um, he then gives it to the head of department called Professor Buerta. And Professor Buerta, he, okay, he took it. Um, and then Carl kept on asking, so, you know, what do you say? Well, and, and Buerta just didn't say anything. Eventually, Buerta, after a few months, Buerta came back and said, I gave it to two people to read. The one person, he understood 10% of it. The other person understood 0% of it. And that was it. That was the end of the story. Um, and then, and then, well anyway, so part of my task today is that this is a worthwhile, this is a worthwhile document to read for economists and other social scientists. Um, and it's probably a good thing that, that it's coming out now. Well, it's going to be published next year. Um, maybe the environment is more conducive to a positive reception um, now compared to 1977. Um, then, many years later, many years later, Buerta, you know, what should have happened to that work that was given by Puerta. Obviously not what happened to it. Um, and then many years later, 10 years later, 
to be precise, or eight years, nine years later, Buddha asked him, well, you've got all these grand ideas about the market order and, and, and economic. Why don't you write an occasional paper on it? Um, because, you know, Carl wouldn't just write for the sake of getting publications, so, so he needed a bit of prompting. And then he wrote an occasional paper in a year, and then Goethe took that occasional paper and said, well, that is really good, I'm going to give it to the High Degrees Committee. That's what he should have done with the first thesis. I'm going to give it to the High Degrees Committee. And then, but he thought, he gave it to Lachmann to read, and Lachmann said, you know what, that's very good. It's better than, it's much more than a master's. He still registers a master's student. It, I mean, you know, this, this is an indicator, you, all, of, all of you have got PhDs, or many of the people here are working towards a PhD. This is an, ex, an indication of the way not to do it, okay? But, so, so um, um, Buerta, Buerta gets that occasional paper, and, says, and Lachmann says, well, it should be a PhD. Um, Buerta takes it, sends it out to one of the most prominent economists of the time, um, Axel Leon Hufut, like the leading macroeconomist of the 1970s and 80s, and he said, well, that is brilliant, it should be published, um, and gave it to another very prominent economist in Canada, he said, that's brilliant, it should be published. He got his, so he got his PhD on that in 1986, 1987. And Leon Hufford said, you know, publish it. And Carl took it to a publisher. The publisher said, yeah, well, it's good. Add a chapter about what's going on in Eastern Europe at the time. But Carl refused to add a chapter because it would date the book. It, you know, it's, it was perfect for him the way it was. Um, you know, when, when I mean perfect, I mean perfect in many ways. Perfect that... When, when, when we, trans, you know, we, 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 we had the original manuscripts and we had it typeset exactly according to it, there was not a single mistake in that entire manuscript, which again was typewritten by his wife Isabella. So that book, that was the book called The Hand Behind Invisible Hand, which we published um, in 2020, Dogmatic and pragmatic views of free markets and the state of economic theory. Um, so that was published, what, 30, 30, 30, 34 years after he had written it. It was a mission to get it published because everybody says, well, it's old. Who's going to look at this? Um, but, but I was fortunate enough to, to get the buy-in from Dan Klein, who was like a leading classical liberalist, you know, of, of a different type. And, and he said, no, no, this, this really should see the day of light. And, and, and um, he's a George Mason, so we got it published. Although he doesn't agree with everything Carl says here, because what he's saying, the title says it, doesn't it? The hand behind it in this land. You cannot expect that... Um, you know, the invisible hand is by economists, wrongly I think, understood to be about the efficient allocation of resources and everything will lead to an, a natural and optimal outcome if only the invisible hand operates. Well, um, can you really depend on the market to achieve that? Do those, does the, the, the structure of the markets that's required to achieve that, that does, does that emerge? automatically as well, or does that need an active sort of governing hand that creates the conditions? Um, so that's what the hand behind invisible hand is about, and, and, and there are different views, the dogmatic and the pro pragmatic views on free markets, but the, for me the really, you know, when, when, when I read that text at, at the time I was a honor student in his class, um, I was the only student, you know, <laughs> and, 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 and we would have like, okay, it was the, the course was history and philosophy of economics, one year course, um, and there was nowhere to hide because there were no other students, and it was, you know, it, 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 it's like meant to be a, 
um, a two-hour session, but, but with Carl it would tend to become a three- or four-hour session over the entire year, so it was really intense. Um, but so the really important part for me in, in that text is this question about the state of economic theory. And for Karl, it is about the state of economic theory. But he hangs his argument of the state of economic theory around this notion of in, the invisible hand. Um, now, most of the reviewers of the book, they just see, they just see that the question about um, market theory and, and, and um, the invisible hand and Adam Smith in that. But, but it's, and they ignore what he says about the state of economic theory. And it's, you know, so you look at the reviews, nobody talks about the state of economic theory that Carl mentions there. Um, and what we've got coming after we publish this book, there's going to be another book which, where he elaborates, and that's now work that he did in the in late 19th, 19th, early 1980s, 81, 82, which deals with the state of economic theory, continuing from what we are going to be exploring today, if, if we get there, at the rate that I'm going. Um, I just want to say that we're not dealing with a slouch, okay? So when this big book was published, I was like, I happened to fall on this. And it, there's a, you know, Carl doesn't believe in all these things that are quantified, you know, I mean, either, um, you can see that in, in, in his career, if you like. But there I get a, 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 a happen to, to, to fall on this seven best new economics theory ebooks to read in 2020, the seven best, and Carl's book is ranked as number two. And then a bit later, 50 best economics theory books of all time, and I don't know how they do the ranking, and the rankings changed. I just looked at it not long ago to be able to report back to you if it's still the same. But at, you know, today the one, number one ranked book is what was at that time number two. Um, Karl Menger, a book written in the 1870s, 1874, really important texts. Um, and Karl's book at the time was, you know, when this came out, was ranked 28 of of the best books to read, of, economic theory books of all time. So he's, he's, had, he's had quite an impact, and, I'm, and that's, you know, that's part of the reason why, you know, we, we, that's why it's probably a good thing for, for this text to come out now. Um, so, coming out in, in, in a, yes. Yeah, I didn't like the interruption. I just wanted to find Please, out, this yes. is the first manuscript. Right? Mm. He submitted it to his, uh, the, his director of the economic uh, department, and then it was parked, right? It was but parked. Does that mean that he stopped working on his uh, principles, his concepts? All this that, that we are covering now is the work that he was <coughs> contained from the first minister. That Thank you much for that question. Beautiful question. Do you want a follow up question on that? Or? No, just finish. Okay. Let, let, let me answer them individually. Yes, it was parked, and he continued working on it. So he then, he then realized, okay, well, you know, he was deflated, I suppose. Um, and his colleagues, I speak to some of the colleagues who, who knew him for the time, he never talked about it ever, ever, ever. We then had, him and I, we had a session on it in 2000. We started meeting on a weekly basis in 2004. And we started reading BX anti and ex post facts. Unfortunately, I then moved to, to Kimberley and, and, you know, was only part-time at this. We couldn't take it on regretfully. Um, and, but what he did is he thought, okay, i got to make this more understandable to people. So, so he starts writing about it. But when you write, start writing about it, that's already difficult. The way you're writing about it becomes even more difficult. 
you're just adding layers of complication. Um, and and, and so, so then he had the notion of making this like an illustration of a broader argument. But now if this is already difficult to read, now you're making a broader argument within which this is going to fit. That's going to be really difficult. So at some point he abandoned that idea although he was still writing to the high degrees committee at WITS, you know, by this time it's now, it is, it is little to late 40s, well, I'm go I've changed my plans, type of thing. Um, but what he then, what he then thought, okay, so when he told me effectively he had three PhDs. The hand behind the invisible one is the one that he actually got his PhD on, by which time he was 48, 49. Um, the first one is the one we're dealing with, and, and the second one is what, for me, has, has really, his thought really captured me, which is that second part, which he then decided to make it stand on its own, and we'll try and get it published. I haven't worked on it yet. Get it published um, once we are through with this one, which is, which is in my view, equally fundamental. And, and if I could talk about that at some point, it, it's phenomenal. The idea that, that we're finding there are so important. Um, and, you know, as we, as we go along, um, I might elaborate a bit on those. Um, tabelo. Okay, so I understand that the author wrote about the state of the economy of South Africa. Hence, his work is still relevant 40, 40, over 40 years later. Not so. So, he didn't write about the state of economic theory in South Africa or in Africa, okay? Mm -hmm. He talked about the state of economic theory, yeah. full stop. Okay, follow up question. In that sense, when, when you study how South African economy itself was designed, taking back from 1910 onwards, you realize how relevant his work is or how it continues to be relevant, especially when you look at the South African context. So as an economic, as an economist rather, what does that tell us about South African economy, the state of economy in relation to how he, he understood the idea of the state of economy itself, especially his praxis, not, not the theory itself. I mean, you know, it's always been, a, for him, it's always been a concern that theory must be relevant. And it's got to be relevant to, and he had brilliant ideas. He had brilliant ideas in the state of, of the South African economy. So we think, we, you know, we, we think that, uh, well, you know, standard economists, trickle down theory. You have enough investment, well, economic growth is going to trickle down and everybody's going to benefit and, and employment will increase. It's not the case, okay? The full employment, we, we, it, standard economics says that full employment is the norm. Who believes that other than economists, okay? Um, Full employment is the norm. It's the exception. Now, Carl would always identify it's the exception. We've, we're utilizing the wrong image, the wrong metaphor. Trickle down is a metaphor. Okay, we're using the wrong metaphor to deal with this. A metaphor that 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 you know he he never pushed his ideas. Carl would be too humble to sit here and do what I'm doing. Okay, he would you know. I'm pushing, I, I'm trying, you know, it's my job to blow his trumpet. Not because it's my job, but because I really believe in his work. Um, um, and so um, he says, no. It, so the South African economy is, it's like a highway. It's like a highway. Now, the more foreign investment comes, then what you're going to have is the cars that are already driving on the highway, they're driving faster. They're going to be better cars. They're going to be more sporty cars. But there aren't many more cars that are on the highway. And most of the 
country and most of the population of, 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 of South Africa, of the continent, they're not driving cars on that highway. They're standing on the side and watching by. And these cars are just going faster and faster and faster. And, 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 and you, know, I, you know, I experienced that myself. You know, at, at that time I was, you know, when, when there was a transition in South Africa, all the donor organizations came in, they're putting money into South Africa. But where do they apply the money? They apply it to economic, report, economic research and economic reports. That's the easy way. They're just wasting the money. And so, so, you know, those who are already busy, they're just more money is being thrown at them. But there aren't enough on-ramps onto the highway. There are no on-ramps onto the highway. And the trickle-down effect, they, therefore, is, is not going to help. It's just going to be more petrol trickling into those um, car, cars. Um, all right, now, I, I don't seem to be making much highway because, because um, Tenda is telling me um, five minutes left. I haven't even, haven't even gotten started. Let me give you 15. By the power investment. What are, you just got to... <laughs> Thank you very much. But by the powers investing at some point you gotta tell you you gotta say talk about ex post and ex artifacts, okay? That's why like we are clear. Let's go today, before and after. So now I wanna give the context to this. Okay. okay. Um, and of course you're aware of the hegemony of neoclassical economics. If you don't know I'll just you'll ask you questions or um, and well, what and that hate Germany really is the notion that well, our economic theory applies to everybody in every place, irrespective. Okay, this universal idea. Um, and therefore, of course, you've got all this sort of the new liberal approach to economic policy making. Well, our, our economic theory, it's universal, it's scientific. It applies to the US, it applies to Europe, it applies to the rest of the world, and so it's one, one brush uh, applied to the rest of the world. Well, I'm not going to get too much into the history of that, but it's not the case, is it? Okay? The institution of an economy matter. Um, so much matters. And, and in a, yeah, okay, so, so you know, in, a, in, 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 well, when, when I talk about institutions, you know, that's something I want to come back to later again and again, because when Carl looks at ex ante facts, well, here I've, I'm finally using that expression on a preliminary basis, he's really looking at the, the institutions of an economy. And to an extent that 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 um, talks to um, Tapelo's question, because economies differ from one another according to the institutions that they have. But institutions is not narrowly understood, but institutions broadly understood, okay, which includes the culture, which includes the very specific environment of of a particular country or nation or what have you. Um, in a sense, it's an old debate, but he's he's trying to find, and, and that debate might, you know, might, might might find its way in sort of an expression that says that the third way. Well, Carl was working on something that hadn't been done. At least that's my view. Um, now, when we look at the neoclassical or the marginalist revolution of the 1870s. Which, which is the type of economics that we're doing today, which arose in the 1870s. But it, it, even though we, we take the 1870s as the beginning date, it was brewing from an earlier period. It was brewing from the time of Thomas Hobbes, who wrote, who wrote um, the Leviathan in the 1850s, 1650s. It was brewing from the time of um, René Descartes, 
Um, and, and, and it's just from that point onwards, we then eventually get to the neoclassical revolution that gives us the economics that we've got, the, that we've got today. But, and so it's, it's what is of interest to, to us is not so much the neoclassical, the notion of the, the, the marginalist or neoclassical revolution, as it is the idea of wanting to be scientific because this is all about wanting to be scientific and saying that economics is a science. And so we see the artisan and well anyway, what, 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 what Carl is going to be talking about is really addressing issues that, that came into um, Western thinking, which is applied to the rest of the world, um, with this enlightenment, okay? And so Karl effectively addresses himself not just to economics, but he addresses himself to the Enlightenment tradition. Um, well, as, as a, by the way, you know, often often you're being told, well, oh, you know, it's you you social scientists, and you've got two options really. There are two paradigms: there's the empiricism, and there's the rationalism. They are just two sides of the same coin, okay? I mean, I'm not going to get into that, otherwise we'll never finish here. Um, but that would be part of the work, the subsequent work of Karl, where he continued thinking about the issues that, that, that he's addressing here. Um, and, now, and now we are sitting in, you know, you all, you, you, you've got your PhDs, you've, you know, you've probably all been exposed, you know, you've, to, you've got to write your thesis in a particular way, you've got to have a hypothesis, and you've got to have data to support that hypothesis, so <coughs> economics proceeds in that way, um, and then you, know, you get taught a little bit about um, Karl Popper. Um, all of that relates to, 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 to Thomas Hobbes and Descartes at that time, you know, just the, the two sides of, of, of the same coin. And it's, it's altogether wrong. Okay, we're not going to get too, into too, too much detail here. Um, but now, so now we've got economics wanting to be scientific, and that's getting us to the problems that we're dealing with in, in, in economics. So wanting to be scientific. But what does it mean to be scientific? Okay, well, wanting to be scientific means... We, you know, we look to what the science, actual scientists do. And what do they do? They do measurements. And you know how the famous saying of, of Kelvin, you know, if you can't measure, measure anyway. Well, that's what economics does. We can't measure, but we pretend to be measuring anyway. What can you measure? You can measure a thing. Okay, I can measure your temperature, and I can keep on measuring it. And eventually I see, well, there's an average, or we might be getting sick, or what have you. What do we measure in economics exactly? Okay. Now, so we know that to measure a thing, the distance of the moon to the Earth, you're talking about things. So you've got to measure things. But what is the thing in economics? If you can't measure, you know, if you don't know what we're measuring, do we even know what the thing is that's, that's in economics? But we want to be scientific. Okay. So, but scientific might also be understood as not just measurement, but about quantification. So let's try that again. Okay. What can be quantified in, in economics? Ah. Now we've got lots of stuff that can be quantified, okay? That's where the statistics, the economic reports that Carl was writing come in, because they're all about quantities. So we, we're not really, so, so, so we're not so much scientific in economics as we are quantitative, but what is quantitative? I'm edging my way slowly to the problem that Carl identified. Um, what is, what do we quantify? Well, we quantify the things that can be counted. What can be counted? Well, I can count how many rands I get paid at the end of the month. 
I can count how many hamburgers I've eaten this month. I can count, um, I just brought some, I mean, you know, I mean, uh, this, you can think of thousands of things that, that, that we can count. Um, the number of people that are employed, um, or the number of people that are, that are not employed, our GNP, our, our, uh, the rands that, that we earn from exports and the rands or dollars that we have to buy, these are all individual things, right? Only the individual things can be counted. And so I'm, I'm, I'm now throwing in this notion of the individual, because only the individual thing can be counted. And therefore your quantification can only be on individual things. Now out of the window, if we, are, if we then adopt this approach to economic thinking, out of the window go things like um, exploitation, for instance, um, culture, institutions, because, you know, they, things that are not counted, economists will then basically say it's, this is metaphysical. Okay, that's, that's an important notion in, in our economic scientific enterprise that it's scientific, uh, metaphysical. The idea of structure, in a sense, gets lost. And, and that's got a, that will relate later to, to, to the idea of ex ante facts. Well, you've read it, so you will see that. So, what, so the statistics that we have, which is things that have been counted, but the things that have been counted are things that do not exist. The things that are counted are things that happened in the past. And that, that is what relates eventually to, to, the, to, the, to the exposed fact. So, so now I've... Um, I'm going to skip this section on, on the statistics. Um, so, so the statistics really are just records of past events. Um, and that's what economists work with. But the economic theory is, about, is, is, is really about something different. Um, now, but now the statistics that we've got, okay, all these table of statistics, the reports that, that we're writing, um, they're just data that's been collected. But now we got to, and in a sense they're just random, because these are just things that happened in the past. But they're just random. But now as a scientist, we don't, you know, we wouldn't, you know, we, 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 we want to be more than, than dealing with random stuff. We want to um, um, have something concrete, a theory to deal with, that we got like a structure, that we can explain something like, like as, as other sciences do, um, actually explain something. And so, so we, we, need, we need to have a way of, of accommodating or having a type of theory that would somehow try and accommodate the statistics. Now, um, this is not how history of economic thought has evolved. I'm just imposing retrospectively an approach to it that, that um, since... The, in, in, this, in this development of wanting to be scientific, we are really looking at the individual. Com the individual. Everything is reduced to the individual. So if you want to, if you, if you look at supply and demand analysis, you've got to re reduce it to the individual. The individual, maxi the maximizing individual. And then even macroeconomics, um, in a sense, you know, we... Neoclassical economics really has absorbed Keynesian economics and, and, and even macroeconomics is expressed in terms of individual decision making. So, um, and, and so the statistics we, we talk about are, are about individual decisions that people have made in the past. Um, and um, so 
So the, the most important theory in economics is, is probably general equilibrium analysis, which is now taking the, the partial supply and demand analysis and applying it to the, to the economy as a whole and talking about efficient allocation of resources and what have you. Um, but it's, it's reducible to the, to the individual. Because that's the only, the only entity that, in a sense, exists. That's you and I, the individual that make decisions. It's, of course, related to subjective value theory. Okay, we, we don't need to get into that at the moment. It's related to the subjectivism. Um, so, I'm going to fast forward and I'll start talking about ex post and ex ante facts. Um, in the context of the individual, and the individual, what matters for the individual, that's that the individual who is making a decision that is choosing this or that course of action, that individual, um, in economic theory, has got a set of preferences. So we've got preference theory in economics. It's really, or, or utility theory in economics, which is really the core of economics. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous if you, at some point when I was reading, started reading um, this, this book more intensely, I thought, well, let me just look at what people teach about preference theory. It's, you have famous economists at MIT who give a lecture to first year students talking about preferences of individuals. They are, they are transitive, you know, if you prefer A to B and B to C, you prefer A to C. And, you know, in a very serious manner, they, do they actually believe this? Um, and, and then talk about maximization and what have you. You know, you know I, I, for a long time I taught law and economics at, at WITS, and, and, and it's like even law and economics and the theory of e economic theory of law, it's all, it's all about preferences, rationality, and efficiency. Law is about efficiency. Um, our behavior is rationality. We're maximizing. It's the rational choice model with which you're all familiar. But it hinges on preference theory. Because preference theory is supposedly what you've got in your mind and makes you behave in a certain way. You know, these are your preferences. That's why, that's why you drink wine rather than something else. And we can take it further. Yes, there's something in your mind that's really making you behave in a certain way. And maybe it's true that we want more rather than less. Um, and you know, we'll, we'll, and, and that finds its way in Carl's work as well. Um, but what I want to say about preferences at this point is only that um, therefore preferences are brought in like a structure. Okay, they're brought in like a structure that keeps that whole, that's like a machinery that eventually leads to all, all those individual exports, imports, purchases, and what have you. So, so therefore, the statistics we have are no longer random, that they can all be brought down to the individual preferences. And so at the heart of everything is economic preference theory. Yes. Well, I don't know, I don't know if I, I agree with, with what you are saying or what the theory is saying. Because in mind I have what you call the anchoring effect. That's what economists use. What effect? An anchoring effect. So you have the notion where they they understand they study human behavior to determine how they're going to sell certain products to them. For example, when you go to Temple Square Mall, you will never see clicks next to this cam. Clicks is always on one side, this cam is on the other. Those are called anchoring, something like anchoring entities, if you like. Because the idea is here's clicks, here's this cam, you must walk in between. As you walk in between, you'll be thinking, oh, I don't have a pair of sneakers, let me go to the sports before I get to clicks or before I get to this cam. When you go to pick and pay, you will never find bread and milk in the same space, or bread and butter, or bread and, 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 and jam in the same space. We have bread in this aisle, and we have milk on the other aisle. Those are two encoding codecs that they put 
apart from each other so that they want you as a as a consumer to walk in between the two uh, entities or the two products and psychologically think oh i don't have a, 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 i don't have a shower gel let me also get a shower gel while, while i'm in between the spaces so my question is is, is, is it a preference that economies to think consumers are bound to, to fall to fall for or is it something that economies themselves create in terms of understanding how our psyche works well you know you 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 arrange your store on the same principle they're still economic principles they're maximization principles you just want you know I want to get a necessity you know the other day I go into a pick and pay things have changed I don't know I don't I'm disorientated and what used to be right at the beginning of the store now I've got to right walk right to the to the end you know past all the luxury goods and chocolate and oh okay now I've got to lose weight but <laughs> to finally find my way there it's it's about you know it, it's just a question of what are you maximizing you know you're minimizing you're not maximizing or you're not minimizing the time I'm spending in 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 my in in the in the, in the store but you're maximizing another objective function we call it economics the objective function is maximizing the profits to to the store owner and the same with you know when when you go to a beachfront you know we've got it in economics as well the hoteling paradox mm -hmm. you will find that um, you have you have um, all on the beachfront. You have all the all the shops together. All the ice cream stores are bunched together. So it's like the opposite. Um, and it, so it, why are they spread out more more evenly to to make it easier for 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 the people at the beach to to get to the ice cream store more quickly? They're all bunched together. You observe that. So it's you know they are. So economic, economics will say, well, we've got a rational choice theory for that. It's cost-benefit analysis. So what you're talking about is still economics. It's just cost-benefit analysis. Okay? How do we maximize the, the passage of feet in a, in a shopping center? And we maximize them by, by anchoring them so that um, you've you got to traverse as much as of the middle ground, if you can, you know, something like this. I'm, I'm sure, you know, there's, there's probably good economic theory for that. Um, all right. Um, so, so, where was I before that? So now we've got to talk about ex post and ex ante yes, facts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Which is, of course, a difficult thing. Um, Suppose that, suppose that um, there's a, there is an aircraft crash and you have to go and investigate the cause for the, for the crash. So, okay, people are going to write the report, they're going to come up with what? Pilot fault. Um, Elect electrical short circuit in a fire, or Putin shot down the aircraft, um, or um, or thunderstorm. What have you? Okay, so so you can have a whole lot of of reasons why this aircraft crashed, but there's one fundamental. I mean, you know, those, those, all of those reasons are, if we, in the report, um, namely that there, there was a bomb in a, in a, in a, in a cargo section, that is an exposed fact. It's a record of past event. We've been able to identify this is, this was the case. There was a bomb. There was a fire. It's an exposed fact. Okay? It's a record of a past event. But then, but let's think into this, can we fit in, an, okay, what, what else? One thing that 
is never talked about. I've never read the report. I'm just thinking. One thing that will never be talked about why the airport crashed is what? Gravity. If there were no gravity, this airplane wouldn't have crashed. Pilot mistake or no pilot mistake. That's like an ex ante fact. But it is so obvious to us, we don't see it. We only see the exposed facts. We don't see the ex ante fact, which is gravity. Take other examples. Um, there were in, in, in the US in the 1950s, there was a famous bank robber. And, you know, he robbed all of those banks, eventually he got caught. And people asked him, why do you rob the banks? And his answer was, because that's where the money is. When you play it. It was when you play it. Because that's where the money is. Yeah. So now, at the, you know, of course, it's people, people make a joke of it. But it is a joke because people expect an exposed explanation. I robbed the bank because my wife prompted me to you know, bring more money home. I robbed the bank because, um, well, I, I saw there's an opportunity. I'll just go in there and, and help myself. Um, so you, you've got all of those exposed explanations and examples as to psychological or whatever, from the individual perspective explanations. These are all, these would be exposed explanations. But the joke is, he doesn't refer to any of that. He gives us an ex ante fact. Yeah, that's where the money is. That's how our economic system is arranged. This is what our institutions are. That's where the money is. That's an ex ante fact, okay? Um, same with, now, now we, we dig deeper along those lines. Um, it is now relevant to our preferences, if you like. Because, um, and in a sense that, that you know, um, Aristotle at the Nicomachean Ethics, which, which I think is relevant in this particular case, is... Okay, you know, we, we get together, we have, we, we, let's say we have, we had one at the beginning of last year. Outside, we all invited for drinks, all the fellows, we're drinking water, we're drinking wine. Primona was there, what did you drink? Why did you, why did you not drink wine? <laughs> why not? Why did you drink this? Why did you drink that? And we give explanations. Well, beer was there, wine was there. That's why I drink wine. But so these are exposed facts that we can give in this particular manner. These sort of explanations. But is there an ex ante fact underlying anyway in our behavior? We drink. Why we drink wine, whatever it is that we're drinking. Because of their taste. Because of thirst. Mm -hmm. We eat food because of hunger. Yeah. 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 Let, uh, is, is possible if we can close back so that we can open okay. the, 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 the. So I've done half. Thank yeah. you very much. <laughs> I haven't yet told you why this is important for economics. I'm just getting to that. Okay, please go ahead. Okay, Tell, ask. All right. Uh, thanks, Mike, uh, for this. Uh, as, as I read uh, Carl's uh, thought, uh, as I told you before, that 1977 and now is still going to be the same resistance. Uh, largely because of the anecdote that I told you, which is uh, ob obvious, the Queen of England, uh, is, 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 she summoned the best economics and he said to them, how could you not foresee this crisis? And none of them answered, you know, <laughs> none of them. Uh, that, uh, why? And the, the thing that has been interesting uh, and what like, you've been showing us is how 
how like the generative thinking in 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 in, in Kasba is like is making is resisting in economics with its deterministic tendencies and pushing to the quotidian to say that no economy is not something that is out there right it is created by human beings uh, but that is denied uh, to us like when, when, when you see hence this rush of science because in science like uh, you are going to find what i would call the despotism of statistics right you know if you have to find those those graphs you get confused and opposite the despotism of, of the, the you have the tyranny of that right that this is a data they feed it to you but it does not explain anything right you know and uh, i like like even the issue of uh, professor Porter that Professor Porter will be there even next year, right? To say, <laughs> no, it's just you know, like let me in, like you know, let me send it to my two peer reviewers who are going to come and say, oh well, it's ten percent, oh well, it's nothing. Nevertheless, uh, the importance of uh, this uh, thinking, I, I would like you to talk more about. Uh, the ex ante, right, which is the very idea of not us being conscious of the obvious, right? And then, of course, the ex post, we want to find justifications, like, you know, I don't know whether to sound sophisticated, but still, the way we have been conditioned uh, of how do we think uh, outside this very logics of futuristic determination to say no it's about stability as you are saying oh investors confidence and then the everyday life gets affected but we are we, we are we are only concerned about it's like uh, employment you, you only hear 32 percent yeah. you don't get reasons why are people unemployed yeah so those are my thoughts and yeah. uh, for now and then, yeah we'll open it Stephanie? um if you would yeah yeah no yeah. I'm, I'm so happy to hear your introduction because I was so lost in the text and I, it made me feel really stupid. But at the same time, going back to many questions that we ask in economic anthropology, and I, I think you, you of this uh, critique of um, economic theory or the singularity of economic theory, you, it would be also a contribution for us to read in economic anthropology. But my first question harkens back to what happened between 1977 and today. For example, what we see with algorithms, how algorithms determine whole economic systems beyond only consumer decisions and consumer monitoring, uh, and also how quantification shapes the indicators that are then taken as forms of representation. But I was also thinking about a small book by Arjun Akadurai, Banking on Words, where he looks into derivative finance. And as I say derivative finance, I have no idea what it is. But I understand that it has to do with speculation and the foreseeing by making of contracts, actually tapping into promises what will happen in the future in a certain sector of finance. So is this an institution that you are interested in when, when you say uh, meta minus uh, theory actually asks for the institutions that determine the context? Or are we actually beyond institutions, right? In the strict sense of definition. And then what are the institutions of that determine our current economic systems? Which are, by the way, you say universalism, I would say they are, Euro, they are still Eurocentric institutions and theories of, of e economics. So I, I would just be interested in this um, speculation as a form of economic foreseeing um, yeah. and how you would. Can I try and answer questions okay. one by okay. one? Sure, sure. Because there's a lot there. Right. I don't want to get overwhelmed. All right, all right. Well, mine is quite similar. Okay. It's also a bit because, um, you know, I, I just listened to how you presented uh, um, this, this tension between neoclassical 
and what Carl was trying to do. Uh, my interest is, I mean, there's an answer, they say there's predictive statistics, right? So if you, if you observe things long enough, you can sort of uh, have a sense of what, what are the results that will happen. So now, if you, I know you didn't get to tell us the heart of, of Carl's theory, but I, I was wondering how do you respond to this thing of probability, which is uh, something that you can calculate and you can, with some certainty, have some uh, confidence in it probably happening. So uh, probability theory, and I know you've, you've spoken about the utility and so on. So I mean, what I'm trying to say is that there are kind of mathematical responses, very automatic ones that are being done to give these kinds of responses to mathematical. That's why this, uh, this heterodox economics, uh, how do we put the uh, Carl's work in the new economic thinking that is uh, trying to undermine this uh, neoclassical or Thank you very much. I'll start with Tanoi. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we had some very interesting sessions here um, over the past few weeks. There was a Canadian professor here. She talked about elites and African elites. And the criticism were really um, deep. Okay, very, and she was surprised by, by the opposition that she was getting, I think. Um, well, why was that? Well, it's explained in terms of ex post and ex anti facts. She was telling us what the elite of Africa is, telling us, well, they, you know, effectively, um, this and that person, let's say, you know, which are which is, it's like an enumeration, you know, this happens to be the elite at the moment and, and then somebody else. And, and so, and then remaining at that particular level, I think especially Stephanie and, and, and Stephen were, were sort of really getting to that saying, but, you, you, you know, you, you, it's like a justification, a justificatory exercise from, from the Canadian sort of uh, north and West, um, but what it's leaving out is is really it's something deeper. Um, who does the counting? You know, I mean, when we talk about elites, you say somebody counts as an elite, um, it, or somebody chooses is, is the chosen one. Who does the choosing? You know, what what are the ex ante conditions that uh, make somebody being considered elite? Because you know, then you have got somebody like. Donald Trump, he's an elite, but we know he's just scum. Okay, so <laughs> why don't we have something? So this is just a, a whitewashing. Okay, so this is how this is how this sort of um, the ex ante and ex post can be used in, in, in many ways, in different areas, and and hopefully we'll get more of those today and elsewhere. Um, for me, the, to Stephanie, um, the ten percent understanding. To me, the best, one of the best values, because now I've just been imbued with Carl's work since the beginning of my academic career. But I did my PhD in in, in Zurich, um, and then and then that's when I, you know, when I started to see, wow, this can not so much this year, but what came later, that can be applied to many things. But it's like. You know, many students say, no, Carl was really brilliant and his honors course was better than we had at Cambridge or anywhere else, but nobody really persisted with it. And I'm, I often I think, am I the only one who's, but why then, what? And then I, I had now this book, early last year I'd sent it out to various people, and, but nobody responds. Nobody responds. Yeah. Well, it's changed, okay, we get, we get, um, we, um, we got very good, it took a long time, but, but, but we got the good referee reports, we got some very good comments. Um, but the best validation for me was this. A student like you, um, I mean, sorry, a, a student, a PhD student in Germany, she was at a Walter Eucken Institute in, in Freiburg. She said, at the institute, she said, I want to do my PhD, in, not on what you're offering me here, you know, 
Walter Eucken, let's have something new. So she goes to another university where they do um, philosophy of, of economics and things, on heterodox economics, and I tell her, oh, well, philosophy, economics, pop at this, that. She says, it's all tat. It's all tat. Don't you have something new? So that one professor, the one she, to whom I had sent the document, he gives that student that, that, the text. She comes back many weeks later. She says, this is it. I may only understand 20% of what's going on, okay? But from the little I understand, this is the only thing that's of interest for me. This is the area I want to work, work in. And for me, that was just such a beautiful validation that there are some people out there, and that's of course the people that we try and find, that are people out there who say, this, you know, this is really something different, something novel, novel something worthwhile engaging in. Um, so, um, on the algorithms and the, the way that economics has become very quantified. Um, and, and, and yes, I mean, much of the economic enterprise has been, oh, we got the set of statistics. And now we've got to find the parameters in there, the sort of the things that give it structure, okay? That, so that we don't have to re rely on preferences as a structure, which is a bit, you know, a bit subjective, if you like. Um, so we find, we try and find the structure in the statistics. And so, like, like, you know, so we can calculate gravity because we've measured it a thousand times and there's a value, 9.9, .9, whatever. Um, and so a Nobel Prize for that was awarded to Maurice Alain in the 1980s, 1990s, where he said, well, um, I've got, I have measured sufficiently and I've got that value for this, I think it was a financial parameter. And he said, well, that value, and, and that is, and that applies in all places at all times. This is, of course, the positivistic approach to things, okay? And so he won the Nobel Prize on that. And of course, we see many other people, financial, especially financial geniuses who create in, in, in long-term capital um, hedge funds that have worked out a way of how to really make money and, and, and on the basis of the work of two financial economists who, who work in that area in financial instruments. But, I mean, it's just a disaster because, because they're relying, and, and the whole financial crisis is really based on that. We don't need to understand the structure of it, um, especially the 2008 financial collapse. We only, we only got to, we effectively only got to look at the exposed facts, never the ex ante facts. And so the structure of the financial crisis was such that, that an insurance, you had like 10 insurance companies betting on the same property. So if it collapsed, you know, and I said the risk is, the risk is exposed fact, the risk is default rate of 2%, even if we push it to 6%, it's okay. But now you have created a structure where this entire property market becomes a, a, a casino. Now the casino is the ex-ante fact. It's been set up like a casino, not like a market. Because you can have um, any number of, of, of insurance companies or interested parties who can, who can put a bet on, on the success or failure of, of this property being paid off or not. And then if, it, if, there's a, you know, if there's a failure, then all the insurance companies, but now it's a failure. And the property is worth $100, but you've got, you've, got, you've got 10 companies that have betted against that. So together, they're losing 10 times $100, they're losing $1,000. Their loss to them on the, on the stock market is 10 times the loss in, actually incurred in the value of the property. Yeah. Yeah. And given that, don't you need also a theory of value in metamized work if you want to critique 
that uh, economic system? Or in other words, is that not the end of economics? Is something like this is possible? Where you don't have a corresponding value, where you, where you don't have a commodity anymore that determines value. What, no. what does it mean for economics? Well, the, that's, a, that's a, such an incredible question because the way that our world operates, it, it really, it's not about tangible things. It's about the intangibles. It's the intangibles that come. The, what, you look at the value of, you look at the value of Google, I don't know, whoever, whatever is the richest company in the world at the moment. You look, you look at the value of our friend Elon Musk. Okay, worth, I don't know, is it, is it the most highly valued company? But the assets that he's got, are worth, I don't know how, how many million dollars, or maybe a one or two billion dollars. But the value on the stock market is, I don't know, 600 billion or a trillion dollars. It is, the, the value is not the tangible things. The value is something intangible. And that's where it becomes, and that's where the ex ante facts become so important because you now got to have to understand the structure of the system. You know, what, what, how is that liable to collapse? Because what does it depend on? It depends on trust. It depends, it depends on how, and, and, and the success, of, or like the financial collapse in the US, the, the, the gambling casino. Have we set it up in such a way that it provides security to the investors? Um, when the whole thing then collapsed, who are we going to secure? They secure not the individual person who's lost his entire life savings, but they're securing the companies that are be too big to fail. And so, and so what we really got to address are, is then these very intangible things. It becomes about the intangible things. And all of economics ought to be about the intangibles. In other words, not the things that you count and measure, because the things that you count and measure are all the exposed facts. You can, you can count them because they are there tangibly, but what really matters are the intangible things. And, and that is all in the institutions, in the setup, in the structures, in the, in the ex ante facts, which are denied. Um, by, by standard economics to have a real existence. Um, and then, and, and so when we like to reduce economics at some point, it goes back to Hobbes. Hobbes reduced society to what? He reduced society to a contract, okay? Um, now, economics is full of contracts. Why a contract? Okay, for instance, what is marriage? Well, marriage, it's a contract. Okay, you, you, and, and you know, you, never mind, I'm not going to go. Why a contract? Because it is tangible. You, you can count it. A contract is about deliverables. At what price, at what time, what quantity. And so, and so it, it's back to that question, ex ante and ex ante, which we didn't get into. Also the question of causation. Because now you're defining marriage by the effects. Okay, not by the cause. You know, you might say a marriage is like a covenant or, um, rather than just a contract. And so, so this would be what I'm addressing here would be part of the next book where we, um, that would come in. Um, so um, there is, you know, you look, at, you look at talking about these massive data instruments that we have now. Um, and so economics now is very excited about this notion of natural experiment. And so the, the Nobel Prize in economics was awarded to Alan Kruger and, and, and Kurtz, whatever. And for, for a paper written in the 19, 1994, I used it a lot in my research method at WITS. I just find it interesting. Um, and, but what it does... In a sense, it just validates what Carl is saying, you know, and this is now, they get awarded the Nobel Prize now because they, are, they say that economic theory predicts that if you employ the, if you increase the minimum wage rate, then employment will decrease. Okay. 
So now, now they do this study in, in New Jersey, and what do they find out? They find out, well, they've increased the, the minimum wage rate, but employment didn't decrease, employment increased. Okay, so does that mean, does that mean the theory is wrong? I mean, you know, if you sense, I'm not, not sure what you sense is, but no economist turns around and says the economic theory is wrong. Even Star, even even Card and Kruger don't say the economic theory is wrong, but therefore we got a disconnect. I mean, there's a lot more details to it. There's there's a disconnect between the data and the economic theory. The economic theory is on its own mission. It does its own thing. Forget about what happens in the real world, and that takes us right back to what Carl was questioning. What what am I doing, having studied economics, and now I write these economic reports? Um, um, so, especially important in the world of financial speculation, Fana financial capitalism, this is what we're dealing with, you know, this is all about the intangibles, um, and, and it, we cannot deal with those intangibles in the standard way of doing economics, where we, we were just counting ex post facts, and the ex anti facts are too difficult for us to, to, to deal with. Um, and so, yeah, probability, I mean, you know, so, so probability, statistics, is a way of dealing with the individuals, the individual, countable individual. And so, um, the probability and, 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 you know, econometrics, you've probably done lots of econometrics. The econometrics is, it's a manner of, 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 of handling the individual because our notion is that the only thing that exists are the individual things that we can count. And so we say that um, the things that are out there are individual things, therefore our, our, our understanding them must be in terms of individual things. So now we've got to develop a mechanism that allows us to deal with the individual things. So we've got probability theory, we've got statistics, they're all ways of, of handling, if you like, the individual. Um, but underlying all of this is that very statement, namely that the way we understand, that given that only the individual thing, the countable thing, is what is tangible and exists, Therefore, the way we understand it must be in the same way. That's not the case. That, that, is, that is an assumption. We can understand, and that is really, you know, that's part of the next book. We can understand things in universal terms. We don't, we, we do, for our knowledge to develop, we don't only have to rely on ways of handling in the individual, we've got we've got universal things. Okay, so so for instance, when we talk about marriage, we say marriage is it just a contract or is it a covenant? If you say it's only a contract, then you say the only thing that we we, we would be taking a nominalist approach to the matter. Um, that it's just a word. There's, no, there's nothing important to, that attaches to the word marriage. You could also call it, you could also call it a contract. It's about quantities and about deliverables. And that's what economics does all the time. What does it say about what is a firm? What is a firm? Now, you would have, you'd give a definition of what a firm. Well, the economist says a firm is just a nexus of contracts. What is an institution? Well, an institution is simply um, um, a, an efficient outcome to deal with a, with a common pool problem. So what is addiction? Becker, famous Nobel Prize winner in economics. What is addiction? It, well, addiction is... I mean, there's a whole thing on that. Addiction is... is, or is, is um, it's not something real. It's not something real. It is just 
a certain spectrum of, of the demand curve or type of demand curves which would be labeled as a example of addiction, but there's nothing intrinsic to it. So, so because all of these things which are not quantifiable are being thrown out as, as being nothing other than um, 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 metaphysical. So um, it doesn't. It, it, so the heterodox question. Um, Karl was not a Marxist, okay, but I think he had more sympathy for Marxist economics than he had for neoclassical economics. Because in, in neoclassical economics, what we do, we, we develop the mathematics and then we go out to find something relevant in our human life to fit the mathematics. And Marx went the other way around, you know, you, you know, there's, there's, um, there is, you know, these are the things that we can observe in the world. Can we somehow formulate this in, in mathematical or, or, or algebraic terms? And so, and so, uh, so at least it's, it's trying to make the maths or the algebra fit the real world rather than the other way around. Um, but there's always the problem of, taking a, a grain of truth and making it the whole truth. So this is what neoclassical economics does. It, it, it says, well, we all, you know, we, I want more wealth than less wealth. And then we use that to explain the entire economic, world economic phenomena in those terms. That's taking a grain of truth and making it all. Um, in Marxist theory, or in, 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 in Austrian economic theory, or Lachmann, the subjectivists, we take a little bit of truth, namely, I value this differently from the way that Tapelo values this, and now we make that the whole truth, and we say everything is subjective, everything is unpredictable, because it all depends of, on an individual, and therefore we've got to be nihilistic, we, we just got to let things take their own course, um, because we can't say anything because it's all in the mind of people and it's subjective. We're taking a, a little bit of truth and we're making it the whole truth. In Marxist economics, we might take a little grain of truth or some truth um, and say, okay, well, there's exploitation and we make it the entire truth. Um, and, and, and this is really the thing that Karl referred to as dogmatic, okay? And, and, and in, it's, it's an attempt to avoid that dogmatism where you, uh, you, know, you, take, you, you, you deal with things um, more, more finely. We could apply that to also to, to psychology, you know, Freudian psychology. You know, it's just about, it's, you know, maybe he, he, had, he had sexual issues with, about his mother and he makes it the whole truth yeah. for his study. Yeah. Um, it's complex is for everyone. But the, 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 the approach is the same throughout. It is like really denying real existence to things that are really important to think about the term good which is the most important adjective that we use on a daily basis it's the word good but you take any text I used to do this with my students honest students I take out you know your, your tutoring take out your, your all your first year second year third year textbooks honest do you anywhere find the word good of course not that would not be scientific. <laughs> but it's the most important thing because even our economics ought to be about what is good. And that is what Karl was ambitious of, what his ambition was, that it's got to be relevant. And our economics is not relevant in, in that particular way because it, it denies things that are not countable to have any real existence. And now I use that word real, and that's why that is a possible candidate as a title for the book. A realist, you know, it's about these things that are actually real, not just what is countable, a realist philosophy of economics. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, uh, Mike, just, just, just a bit on uh, Stephanie's concept of uh, economic anthropology. What are your thoughts, just briefly? On, on, on. Well, that would be a brilliant thing. I mean, economics, to be a subject itself to be studied, is that, that's how I understood it. As a, as a, as a, no. not, okay. Because you, As a practice. you mentioned that there is this dictum of full employment is the norm. Yes, yes. Now, if we look at Marshall Salins, the original human society, or David Grebbers 5,000 years on that, or even now the work he has done with David Wengo, employment is not the norm. It's part uh, okay. of the problem. Yes. Because you don't you have work, 
you have labor and you have employment. And there are qualitative differences. For example, care work or the labor of caring for the elders or for the children is, is not monetized. In some societies it is not. But it is a form of work, it is a form of labor, but how does it figure, in most senses of the word, for economic reproduction, right? How, how does uh, giving birth and fostering life figure in an economic equation? Does it or doesn't it? Right? Which is a lot more, um, which, which is really, you know, that sort of approach, would give us a better understanding of economics than uh, understand of, of yes. uh, economic yes. situation than economics provides yeah. us. That's why you're being told if you don't want to study one paradigm in economics, go and study anthropology. Mm. But but this is also primordial in a way because in anthropology we look at gift economies, we look at reciprocity, yeah. we look at generalized forms of exchange, right? That then have certain value in society. But I believe that even with derivative finance, but the, the example you mentioned with Elon Musk and the, the value that is created at stock exchange, that itself is also, through its semiotics, becomes a new materiality, you know? Even if it's not tangible, even if it's not commodified, our social economic systems, they, we credit it with a certain value, right? We believe that a certain firm or company has esteem, has value, we it goes to Wall Street. Now, the thing, of course, you know, what, what we, in a sense, what Carl, what we're doing is rethinking, and I'm not, I'm not claiming this is about decolonial at all, no, but, 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 it is, it is all, <laughs> it is all the more important because economics. I'm sure you've heard about imperialism of economics, mm -hmm. that the economic method is now applied in so many subject areas, swamping out these other approaches. Mm -hmm. In Australia, they closed down our anthropology departments mm -hmm. at, at various universities. Yeah. Yeah. And instead, the, the faculty for economics is growing and growing and growing. Yeah. And so we really got to work on the antidote to the imperialism of economics. And, and uh, that the objective of this particular center here is to not take um, our model of economics and applying it elsewhere, which is the imperialism, but we don't even understand your, our own subject. And that's why you say they will reject it. Yeah. We don't un understand our own yeah. subject matter. We even deny that there is a subject matter specific mm -hmm. to economics because we define economics as our tool, which is rational choice theory, and that can be applied to anything. And therefore, economics, uh, economics act. So we've got we've got the economic theory of law, economic theory of the family, economic theory of of, of animal behavior, economic theory of of, of social economics, and what 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 it just carries on, and. But there's even we even fail to grasp our own subject matter, so such that we have financial collapses, um, financial crisis. We have continued poverty, um, increasing poverty, because we're clearly getting something wrong in the, in the way we are approaching this. And so it's a matter of of developing new tools relevant to economics in a way that that that. Um, the authors that you're referring to have identified manners of conceptualizing what's going on. It's important for economics because it could be used, for instance, as an argument for um, 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 what you call the income grant, basic income grant mm. in South Africa and elsewhere in the world. Because our economic theory says that, if we look at income and distribution, we say, what is the economic theory of distribution? It's the marginal productivity theory of distribution. Namely, you get, re you get compensated according to your contribution to output. Marginal productivity. And therefore, okay, so that determines the salary that you're earning. Wrong. That's not the case. The, the true theory of distribution in this world is incumbency theory. Okay, you happen to be at the right place at the right time, you get paid a salary or not paid a salary. It's not about you that the CEO that's earning 60 million rand a year, he hasn't made 60 million, contributed 60 million to it. No, something else is at work here. You look again at the institutions, you look at the ex ante facts. 
Who decides on his salary? It's the board members. Who are the board members? The board members are employees of another corporation. And who sits on the board of that other corporation? Your friend to whom you're giving a higher salary now, if you give him a higher salary now, he will give you a higher salary when they have their salary meeting. It's not it's that marginal productivity. And so, you know, that could not be taken to the basic income grants um, argument, if you like, because, because our, econo our, our, our modern economy our modern economy is an amazing machinery. We could produce, we could produce, I mean, if, if you look at the average capacity of, of enterprises in South Africa, they're running at 60 or 70% capacity. I used to be in business. Ah, oh, man. Mm. Capacity is no issue. You can ramp it up. And we can produce more and more with less and less, with fewer and fewer people. We can produce enough commodities, enough goods for the entire planet for everybody, if we had the means of getting it to the people. Okay, so our real problem is distribution, it's not production. Do you know that? They, they, they. Oh, yeah. uh, maybe I can relate to it. Would you consider, or would come, <laughs> consider this whole circulation of limits of growth, right? I mean, it's not also contested because private people are flying to Mars and they have found water and so on and so forth. But clearly, let's assume we only have this planet for the moment. Would you consider this limits of growth, degrowth movements, economies of repair as also a critique or is it also just um, a result of this predominant economic theory? Or would, would you think there can be also a theoretical critique emanating from this day-to-day -day practice, right? We, 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 our rubbish is being thrown there, but then in other parts of Johannesburg it's reused, right? Down there at the junction, the cans are being collected and they're, they're being infused in a maybe alternative or secondary economic system. Would you see this as a the theory, or is it just part of the same economic system? I think it's part of the same economic system. My tendency is to think that no, this this notion of there's a limit to growth mm -hmm. is is the economist's paradigm, effectively. That, um, but when you know, I mean, growth, it's always there's got to be more responsibility on the individual, okay? So take the following, take, take this example. Um, uh, okay, maybe, maybe I can just do that, okay. You look at, in a sense, okay, I call Karl a classical liberalist, okay? But, so that's a very different thing from, that's a very different interpretation of classical liberalism. Um, compared to what, what just about everybody else has. The real issue of classical liberalism, of Adam Smith, of the early liberalists, um, was to find a way that we can, we can actually reward productive activities. Because they're coming out of a society, medieval Europe, where plunder was the norm. Plunder is the norm today. Plunder is what the world is all about. And a plunder is, it finds itself, the, you look at Marcus Euster, okay, Steinhoff collapse, you know, I mean, cost 200 billion. You look at the, the plunder of the oligarchs in Russia. Uh, and because of that, you know, we got to have yachts, super mega yachts roaming the sea and whatever. It's all based on plunder. It's all just based on plunder. And so um, our economy must devise a way that the future world economy has got to devise a way where plunder is not what is being rewarded. Many of the political institutions are also there to plunder. We can, you look at ESCOM. ESCOM is employing 
double the number of people today it was employing 20 years ago, and it's producing less outputs. It's, it's plunder. It would be much better to take those resources, eliminate the ability to plunder, and have a basic income grant, which is more evenly distributed. And so if you, if you, it's, so and that's, let's briefly talk about the ex-ante and ex-post facts. It's like, you know, if, if you have, if you have, you have bread, you wonder how does bread come about? Well, it comes about by its ingredients, eggs, sugar, wheat, you, you put your egg there, your sugar there. Okay, but just putting it there doesn't give you bread yet. Okay, so you've got a loaf of bread, tangible, it's there. You can count it. You've got your inputs, ingredients, it's tangible, it's there. But bread is more than just, it's more. Okay? The, the sum is greater than the, sorry, that the whole is greater. And that's what's denied in modern science. The whole is greater than the sum of the individuals. The individual components doesn't make you bread yet. It's when you put it together. That's where the, the chemical, the things that happen there, when you put those ingredients in, those interactions that's, that's leading to the leavening of the bread, that is your ex-ante fact. So the same with, 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 with the economy. It's where the money is. Where is the money? What do people do with the money? If we do what we're doing with the money, if it's all in the hands of a few people that are buying luxury goods, then no, this planet is not, there's a limit to growth. But if we give them, if we do use the money in a different way, it's, it's going to have different, different <coughs> results. So if you have a basic income grant, different things will get done with the money. The different things will then actually create some enterprise. Okay, so it's it's the inverse of the economic thinking, and I, you know cause and effect plays a plays a plays a large role in that, and so, um, but anyway, so you know that, that 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 that's my thing on that. You know that? Um, how could you push 
um, that line of thinking to really get it to align, really take apart these concepts that have just been normalized. Sure. I didn't say it together. <laughs> <laughs> Is something to think about? You know what? I pray. And I mean it, I pray, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Which of course already pre precludes me from being a scientist or an economist, especially a social scientist, that the book, uh, uh, that's limited what I can do. That the book goes out there, and the next one, and then it's people like you who kind of say, I'm going to pick on this, I'm going to pick something on this, I'm going to take it, I'm going to add to it, I'm going to critique it, I'm going to see where it leads me. That, that it, 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 it generates momentum in that particular way. That is, that is my prayer. Um, then, yes, because on, on, on the, on the lib liberalism and I like, Hobbes, okay, we already talked about Hobbes, we, you talk, he says, and that, that is uh, goes with Descartes and everybody else in the beginnings of our Western and our Enlightenment, um, says that society does not exist. The society is created. Okay? Human being is not a social animal. Human being is an island. That is where we've made the first wrong step. Okay, we made that first wrong step in at the time of Hobbes. So we were oh, at the time of Hobbes. Hobbes was called the monster of Malmesbury. Why was he called the monster of Malmesbury? Because he denied he denied the existence of society. He denied anything other than that was effectively quantifiable. That's it. You know, that then got us to William Petty, the physiocrats, and, and the modern economics. By the way, Marx identified Petty as being the first economist, but he was basically just a pupil of Hobbes. And so we've made our... He were, in his society, he was considered a monster because he came out with things like that. But nowadays, all of social science accepts what he says all of Western social science. But that's where we made the first wrong step, by buying into this notion that society doesn't exist, all that exists are the individuals. And we've got to go, we've got to go all the way back there and, and effectively make a new start. The new start will then not put the emphasis on the exposed facts, but the new start will put the emphasis on the ex ante facts. Yeah. And Stephen also yeah, I don't want to be specific, but I want to be very general because uh, specific is very, it's not a case that I don't want to be it's too technical and then no more social science but uh, um, my thesis is from the, my PhD is called Lenin's Republic about that. So when we, uh, what you are saying is very interesting because um, the same problem that you are discussing in economics is the same one that psychology on particular time of science, so the one interested, which I find it very disturbing in psychology, like how can psychology be such a disturbing in itself. So I, I, what came to my mind was the idea of control. Just control. If you look at it, control. That I teach, I used to teach first year in some eight years ago. I used to teach them about the GDP. I told them, don't ever listen to me. What is GDP? Or to say our property. Two dollars and whatever, you know, they may some of who said two dollars. You know what two dollars means? Mm -hmm. Talk about who's rich, who's poor, or who decides what. So, what you're trying to say is to say that uh, what he's trying to argue is to say these things are just created by someone. Okay? He who creates it creates a value. Creates? Creates a value that he defines. Mm -hmm. You control other people to fall into what he says. That's how. Uh, so, I was thinking also for. Uh, this other, uh, I think is a, but I think it's also for Kool. Cool. Mm -hmm. There's a program about Thomas Kool. Yeah, yeah. Thomas Kool. Mm -hmm. What we think is scientific and all, it's just, most of them are just uh, the products of their own time. So, it's all right. so it, it was, it's quite interesting. And um, unfortunately, we never look at 
But but it was so what I was thinking about you know, to know about economics, but to me it was more like general attract. This is the general way in which because when people create a theory, sometimes they make it like the knowledge, then it becomes this standard, then you go forward with that. That's why even after you know thinking that the document that I need to think is it there? What do you what can I just go and buy it? Then I know it's the equipment and money to fix it. So for me, it was just, it, this is just the idea that would come into me and find the pressure, uh, the issue of value, the very simple. Because I still remember there was a time, huh? I think during uh, Zuma's time, um, it, it was just one morning, I don't know what he said, maybe he fired one mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he yeah. fired one guy. Yeah. Then the, the economy was probably yeah. spoken yeah. in yeah. the first minute. So I thought about that. It's about statements of people, the value of the people. And that's what the meeting also shows. And, and who decide. So when people panic, like we stop at the table, they have that. So I think that is uh, very sensible because I, I don't know the details of the actual um, theories, but I was just thinking, this is why he is relevant. It's actually he's questioning what is being, the faith that is being, we are looking at it. And so I think it's making more, humanity is more real. Because what you're trying to say is to say, I tell the people who have always got the money to know they express it. That's why the money is. Actually, we're trying to realize that's actually. It all goes down to are people, if people eaten, is everyone else got what they have? Maybe maybe even the issues of eating just do justice is also an yeah. idea of that. So I just thought it was for me it was just uh, touching in a very bigger way. We don't actually master it the actual technical terms. Well, it's, it's actually yeah, very important because um, okay, you, 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 there's this notion of facts. Okay, there is a problem with the very question of fact. What is a fact? I mean, modern philosophy will even deny that they are facts. Okay. But now, and it emerges from, and, and Kuhn is related in this, it emerges in, it emerges really that, you know, the positivist, the positivists have always tried to say that, well, true or false pertains not to words like good or truth, true and false pertains to statements. And you make statements and then you you make a hypothesis and then you check the facts as if the facts existed as they are. And so Kuhn and others come along and Karl would be amongst those with Kuhn. You cannot have a value, you cannot have a theory independent facts. Facts are theory laden. And the same with the same with therefore and in the same way looting and all of that is laden with the way of life, with, with where we're living and how we're seeing things. Um, and so this is addressing the very fundamental questions like what are the facts? Now, the thing about the, thing about the this fear, you know, this notion of fear laden, philosophers, oh, thank God, there are not too many philosophers or economists, but it wouldn't make a difference anyway. They were getting all into, into, into economics because they've got nothing. They don't have, like the economists, they don't have a subject. They've defined it out of existence. So now they become philosophers of economics and philosophers of medicine and philosophers of pandemia and what have you. Um, and so, um, because the, the philosophers now say they are no facts. But the point about the theory-laden fact is that it doesn't deny the existence of facts. It should make you aware of what are the circumstances in which the facts occur. What, what are the notions? What is the discourse? What is the, um, you could call it episteme and what have you. But in a sense, well, um, 
in a sense, it's it's got a. I think I think what what yesterday had a very there was a very nice seminar here. Um, Dalit Menon on a book, um, changing, yeah, theory. changing theory, and the emphasis was on the words that there is, unlike what the pos positivists say, and unlike what the theory laden people like Kuhn and I can mention especially um, Quine. They say it's all just a web of belief. It's all a web of belief, you know, there's nothing real. Um, it's like this, this, this capturing back to the value of the actual word, that no, no, um, there's a way of life that goes with a word, and if we want to understand, the, the word has got meaning, it's not just a label, because that's how we try and see things. Everything are just labels. Economists refer to children as a semi-durable good. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. And so, and I, and I say, and, and, and that's what you know. All the, all of the positivist economics was about. It's it's that that the words that, that we're using are just labels because our language is just labels. Words. It's like it's like it's making believe that the words are not attached to real things. It's making believe that if we want to understand what a person says, even a Martian can come and just have a dictionary. Because all words are in a dictionary. But every word in a dictionary is defined by another word in a dictionary. So you're never outside the dictionary. And and so if we're treating words to be just labels, we're never going to be outside the dictionary because they're just defined and you can define them arbitrarily. And unless we, we recoup that sort of connection to the way that we're living, that's the realist part, in the way that we recoup the way that we're actually living, and the meaning of the words within that, um, we, 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 we're going to have a disconnect. We will continue having a disconnect between theory and, and em empirics. Yeah, uh, yeah. Mike, uh, thank you so much. I, I have to bring this to a close. Like this, this uh, as, as I said before we started, that it's going to be a very impatient discussion. And uh, indeed, it is a series, and we are looking forward uh, to have a, a, another sequel uh, to this uh, seminar. Uh, just uh, uh, to, 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 to close, uh, I, I must say that yeah, we need a new way of, uh, of teaching and this space has allowed that uh, fruitfully so, uh, for me in part and uh, I hope to you, to all of you as well. Uh, yeah, so yeah, today uh, I just took uh, Fazil uh, space in the year, in the year next week, like, you know, like in, in terms of how uh, we are going to uh, outrun, but we will have uh, another uh, seminar next weekend. Uh, just also to share with you that uh, we would like to congratulate Tabelo for being a newly minted PhD. Yeah, so. Yeah, this yeah, <laughs> this adequate news. Yeah, so let's be here and uh, gather. Mike, thank you so much for this uh, generous uh, seminar. Thanks. And uh, uh, also, please give yourself a round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, guys. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Mike. Thanks. Well, and, and then they came by saying, no, the economy is scientific. We don't deal with personal oh. issues, but at the same time, use the basic issues to continue to push the economy. Yeah. So, yeah, the justification that, that, there is a justification for that. Um, so, that would be the work of.
Ah, 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 that, yeah, well, and so, you find that, 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 to, that, 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 Okay. But I mean, that doesn't mean that I agree with it. I agree with yeah, what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay. Right. So, 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 so. Dr. Thank you very much. Thank you so 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 much. we also look a bit short. Yeah, I got it ignited. Yeah, I do. Thank you so much. I think always come up with these memes, you know, the group of people who have to be exposed. The group of people who have to be exposed. Yeah. Of course, I'll never get in the end. And they're like, this is what...